Chairman, um, colleagues, and Jeffron, thank you very much for the uh, opportunity of sharing a few thoughts and ideas this afternoon. I promise to be quick. My colleagues already have presented fantastic data, have done all the hard work, so I can actually finish very quickly. Um, and by the way, before today, I hadn't met my colleagues before, so you can see this is obviously marriage made in heaven. Um, so very quickly, and I promise to be pretty swift about this, what is the issue in terms of vasoplegia? I'll just define it very quickly. What the current options are, our personal experience I'll spend a few minutes on, and then what I think are next steps um, for the future, and a lot of them will be married by colleagues today. Issue for me as a clinician, as a intensive care doctor who sits um, in the hospital and then gets called at night, what is the problem? The problem is, is, vas is, is vasodilatory shock. It is a state of hyperperfusion. There is low SVR. There is decreased vasomotor tone. And of course, it has multifactorial etiologies, whether it's sepsis, whether it's post-pulmonary um, bypass, cardiopulmonary bypass, as I'll mention in a minute, whether it's trauma, burns, poisoning, etc. That is the end point of what I see, and that is what I'm faced with when I'm sitting there in the ICU. It has uh, multiple, if you like, variations on a definition. Um, I hope you recognize these. But what I want to bring to your attention is normal or reduced central filling pressures. How do you actually standardize for that? I think it's really important. We can probably agree on a lot of the earth stuff, but things like vasopressors and normalizing filling pressures, how do you actually standardize for that in the intensive care? Do we all have agreement, if you like, on what that is and how you measure it? For one, we use a PA catheter. That's not everybody's cup of tea is what I'm getting at. So there's various um, standardizations which I think are important. I make a special mention for cardiopulmonary bypass. I work in a cardiac center. Um, and this affects a lot of patients. This keeps me up every week, at least once a week, okay? So my, my poor sleep isn't because of my three children. It is because of high lactemia and, you know, high vasopressor requirement. My kids, bless them. Um, I changed the nappy. That doesn't keep me up, though. Um, so a lot of these people require large amounts of vasopressor, whether it's NORAD, whether it's dopamine you guys use, or adrenaline, or vasopressin, doesn't matter. It's a, it's a high amount. It's escalating. And we know post-bypass, these people have a high mortality and high morbidity. Who, is, who do I pick that I know this is going to happen in? The people who have had a longer bypass time. Um, not just the transplants. I mean normal, just cabbage, just AVR plus cabbage, just MVR plus cabbage, plus MVR, TVR plus cabbage. I mean, as many variations as my surgeons can do for me, you know. And the longer they spend there, um, then the, the, the warm, warmer the core temperature on bypass, the longer the duration of the bypass, the more the right heart failure, the more vasoplegia. You know what the, 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 the game is. The people who've had pre-op uh, antihypertensive medications, and if people have got COPD, or somebody's inflamed with bronchiectasis and got pseudomonas somewhere, you can expect that some mischief is going to happen a bit later on. What do we mean by refractory? I, I don't know, actually. Does that mean refractory to conventional dose norad and vasopressin? Does that mean refractory to steroids? Does that mean refractory methylene blue? Does that mean we've now got angiotensin 2? I haven't used it yet, um, but, uh, you know, it's out there. What does it mean? We need some agreement on that. And then what are the options? At the moment, this is what I have. I don't have IL-6. I'm not as blast as Fernando uh, uh, and as, as other colleagues who have IL-6 at the bedside. I don't have this, but I have high-dose noradrenaline. I have angiot... Well, I hope I have angiotensin 2. I use methylene blue, and of course, I've used extracorporeal blood purification. And, 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 a little, and a few thoughts on that today in terms of our experience. We looked at our five-year usage of methylene blue and after post-cardiac surgery and refractory shock. And we have 125 patients in this group, so it's purely an audit at this point. Almost 100 are in the intensive care and 28 in theatre. Forget the four lovely people who are in... in uh, in recovery, they came to ICU anyway. You know, everybody comes to ICU, finally. When they every, well, stops go off, they all come to intensive care. So that's fine. But what I wanted to share with you was that 62% of those people who came who in the ICU post-cardiac surgery were post-cardio bypass, pulmonary bypass, bypass, and about a third had sepsis, roughly. Two-thirds had low filling pressures. And that is in a unit which measures with PA catheter and echo. So I don't know what's happening in the places that you don't use it. I've no idea. But two-thirds had low filling pressures, so you want to get it up. We used um, methylene blue at two milligrams per kilogram in, in most people, and a quarter required a second dose. Yes, 13%, it was contraindicated. Who cares? You know, we have to save the life. But interestingly, what was the survival? 
all comers was 38% in our five-year group. Of those people who got methylene blue, just over a third made it out the unit. And there's a group that you can't see, unfortunately. I don't know why, but that's, that's post-lung transplant. This group here is post-lung transplant. And 71% of those people made it to the, out of the unit. So it's an interesting group. So that leads me on to extracorporeal blood purification. You know what it is. I'm not going to bore you with it because you've heard it in better detail than I can describe. But what I do want to say is that there seems to be an increasing practice. Definitely, I'm interested. And, and the rationale is very straightforward. You know, however, there's still doubt because the, as you've heard very eloquently, the long-term outcomes of these patients have yet to determine consistent results in terms of survival. The other thing is, it's not one condition. Sepsis, as you heard, is heterogeneous. Um, and I was describing this to a colleague earlier. It's like being, going to a wedding. At the wedding, if I'm the father of the bride, I'm the main man. Okay? So in post cardiopulmonary bypass, maybe this is the treatment. Maybe uh, extracorporeal blood purification is the main man. Maybe it, it trans, tra you know, traverses you past the eye of the storm and you're better again. When it comes to sepsis, I'm the brother-in-law. So if I don't turn up, I don't turn up. If I do, I do. And actually, the father of the bride, the mother of the bride, the bridegroom, everybody else needs to be there as well and do their part, otherwise this whole thing goes down the tubes. So I'm part of the process, I'm not all of it. And that role is really important to define in what setting, what is the function of this whole process. So we've used Cytosol, we've used Oxiris, we've used HA330, we've just started using 380, and I'm just going to share some un unpublished, raw, uncontrolled, real-life data, which keeps me up at night. So this is the vasoplegia, high vasopressor requirement. This is the hyperlactemic group. It, it, not everybody, but some of them. And this is the context of post-bypass SERS or sepsis. Those are the 18 patients I'm going to share with you. As you'll see, most of them are post-bypass. We've got a post-lung transplant with ECMO. I've got a, a, a post-VATS empyema. But on the whole, a lot of it is post-cabbage, post-MVR, TVR, decompensated DCM with sepsis, post-AVR, um, MVR, etc. So there's, a, there's a, a fair mixture there. I'm going to share with you the lactate change in 24 hours, the mean time to reduction in, in lactate at, at, in a 50% reduction, the vasopressor reduction, the immune duration of our intervention, and the 72-hour ICU survival, and then the crude ICU mortality. The caveat. Not everybody had a high lactate, and I'll do that separately. So in this 18, the mean lactate at the beginning was 4.65. You might say, hey, that's not very high. Maybe you're right. At 24 hours, it had dropped to 2.5. And, um, and so roughly, it took about 25 hours to get a 50% reduction in the lactate in the whole lot. In terms of noradrenaline, by 48 hours, it was, it was under half, although just it was close to half. Basically, it takes about 39 hours to get a 50% reduction. Interestingly, in two patients, the vasopressor requirement went up, not down. The vasopressin reduction was 50% in 48 hours. Much easier to define, interestingly. And the mean duration of our HA330 was 33, 34 hours. It's a mean. It's not obviously, it, I haven't given you the ranges. 72-hour ICU survival is 94%. But look at that. At, at discharge, it's 50%. That's a long drop, isn't it, from 94 to 50? Pew. So there's got to be something there that's missing. That's why I say I'm not the father of the bride in that one. I'm the brother-in-law. Something isn't quite right. Here's the hyperlactemic group. And you'll see most of these are post-bypass. I've got an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, okay? But most of these, and a lung transplant, most of these are um, hyperlactemic. Uh, these are. N equals 9. So this time... The mean time to, reduce, to produce a 50% reduction in the lactate is 11 hours versus 25. The mean time to achieve 50% reduction in NORAD is 34 versus 39. You might say, hey, not, not a massive amount. Um, in, in, uh, in terms of vasopressin at 48 hours, 64% reduction in vasopressin. It's almost two-thirds. It seems more sensitive, doesn't it? And my use duration of HA330 was... Slightly less by a few hours, nothing major, but almost 29, 30 hours. 72 ICU survival, 72 hour ICU was 100%, but look at the discharge. The survival of discharge is 44%. The 
there's more to this game than meets the eye. So I can't make any claims here. It's all hypothesis generating. Of course it needs an RCT, and, and I'm very keen to do one. And I'm going to very much reiterate what my colleagues and indeed learned colleagues have said over the, over the whole day today. We need to move from the observational to the RCT. Yes, of course, there's fantastic post hoc analysis. Use it. Let's pick up those signals and do something with them. We need a more targeted focus. We need to go with etiology. And yes, appropriate patient selection, and according to etiology for me, the threshold. When do we go? Is it after steroids? Is it before methylene blue? Um, how long do we use the cartridge for? Um, what is the duration of the treatment? What's the dose? Are they filled? Are patients adequately filled? How do you know? I know how I know. I put the pia catheter in, I measured it all. Okay, so I know how I know. Echo, no tamponade, biventricular failure, normal ventricular failure. What's going on here? I know. I'm lucky. I have friends who'll do it for me. Okay? Because the surgeon will go, oh, patient's fine when I left him. You know, that's okay, but when I put the TOE down, the RV looks like this, it's not great, you know. So that's really important. Have we taken into account the confounders, hemoglobin, fluid balance, effluent dose, duration? And of course, you've got other rescue therapies that can, can muddy the water, whether it's angiotensin 2 or methylene blue, whatever else you use. We must never forget that this whole syndrome can be compounded, can be um, confounded by other mimickers. Tamponade, in my case, is a big one, but you need to be aware of it. Each vasoplegia, each vasoplegia syndrome has its own natural history. In the case of abdominal sepsis, it could be you need a surgeon, okay? It could be you don't need a surgeon. If you do, it's a big player. You need a good surgeon, you know? Um, if it's pneumonia, is this pneumonia, is this um, pneumonia, so if, if, it's, if it's chest infection, is this abscess where the guy needs a drain? Or is it ventilation, hemodynamics, and antibiotics that are doing all the main heavy lifting? Everything's a bit different. So they have common outcomes, which of course are survival, length of stay, renal failure, etc. But then they have specific outcomes to that particular etiology. So we need to evolve from cytokine base endpoints. And I'm not saying leave them. They need to be hand in hand. Because as you heard my colleague say, if I don't know what I'm measuring, I don't know when to start. That's the problem. I need a good way of knowing when to start. I need patient-centered metrics, though. They need to be physiology, they need to be financial as well as patient. The safety is crucial, whether it's platelets, whether it's linezolid removal, whether it's, you know, um, complication from high-dose vasopressors, to and fro, to, you know, pro and cons, you need to have the safety metrics. I need NNT data. The, 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 the stats has to be really good. And I need to look at endpoints like renal replacement therapy. And of course, post-sepsis syndrome. It isn't about bye-bye at the door and you've gone. It's what happens to you a year down the line. I can, you can make someone better, but you can reduce their quality of life hugely. I want somebody who is as good as when he came in, if not better. And of course, all this can influence positioning of any intervention, because depending on what, what, what um, rank you are in the order, you have to produce your study accordingly. So there are multiple ongoing studies, I'm delighted to say. I think two years ago, I wouldn't be able to say this. Um, and they are across the world, and they are in different organ systems, I'm delighted to note. Um, 380 obviously is replacing 330, and I'm seeing that change as well. And I think this is very, you know, this is, this is encouraging, hugely encouraging. So in summary, I hope I've caught up, Chairman. Um, refractory vasoplegia remains a common clinical scenario. It carries a significant mortality and morbidity. Our initial clinical experience has been quite encouraging, but it is an uncontrolled cohort, N equals one center, and it poses more questions than it answers. Important questions, though. There are prospective audit, uh, studies underway, and that is fantastic to see. But the evolution of the study design is crucial, and the metrics is crucial, because we need to capture the, and quantify the size of the signal, and that allows us, and you heard from from uh, Fernando earlier, you don't know what the host response is going to be. So if I'm going to personalize the treatment, I need to know what that host response is to know whether I'm going to intervene or not. Clearly, it is a multi-stakeholder collaboration and exciting times are ahead as we begin to finally make a dent in this important condition. Thank you very much indeed.